Cairn Review Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Kirkintill Herald Podcast, recorded at the Bishop Riggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Cairn Review. That is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at tunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141-772-3976. That's 0141-772-3976. This week's podcast, dated Wednesday the 31st of January, is read to you by volunteers Alan, Corey, Hunter and Ian. Fighter gives the gift of life. An Eastern Bartonshire dad, who made the decision to donate his kidney to a stranger, helped save three lives. Now, following the remarkable chain of events, Paul McVeigh wants to help raise awareness of living kidney donation. The Northern Ireland native donated his kidney in early 2023 after reading about altruistic kidney donation online. Former MMA fighter Paul, who now runs a gym coaching mixed martial arts, had been thinking about donating a kidney altruistically for a while when a conversation with Dr. Wife, Mauve, cemented his decision. He said, I was speaking to my wife about one of my grandparents who had been on dialysis and she told me about patients she had treated who had renal failure, its impact on their lives and the difference that kidney transplants can make. It really got me thinking about how I could change someone's life in this way. There were loads of reasons that I wanted to do it. I worked professionally in sports for many years and I've been lucky enough to remain in good health my whole life. I was in a good place to donate physically and I wanted to pay forward my good fortune. My job also allowed me to take time off to do it. The pros significantly outweighed the cons. Overall, it felt like a demonstrably good action, something that would make my children proud and which fell in line with the type of person I aspire to be. I registered my interest with NHS Blood and Transplant, which led to a series of tests to find out if I could be an altruistic donor. When I got confirmation that everything had been approved, I was really relieved and excited. Over 400 people in Scotland are currently waiting for a kidney transplant, with living kidney donation playing a vital role in increasing donation and transplantation rates. A kidney from a living donor generally offers the best outcomes for patients in need of a transplant, and a healthy person can live a completely normal life with one working kidney. People can donate to a loved one in need, or can donate altruistically to a stranger on the waiting list, who is a match. There have been 1,905 kidney transplants from living donors in Scotland since the first pioneering surgery took place over 60 years ago, with 95 taking place in 2023. Having been entered into the UK Living Kidney Sharing Scheme, 41-year-old Paul's exceptional gift sparked a chain of of three transplants. He added, Going into my surgery, it didn't feel like too big a deal. I don't want it to seem like what I did was exceptional. I just went into surgery for a few hours. It's the talent and skill of the surgeons, coordinators and other NHS staff that's remarkable. Everything went to plan and I was up and walking a couple of days later. Within a couple of weeks I felt pretty normal, although I continued to take it easy. After three months I returned to my job coaching MMA, which involved lifting weights and taking part in jiu-jitsu. Being down one kidney has had no impact on my life whatsoever. I'm just as healthy as I was before, though donating my kidney was encouraged me to make, take better care of myself. A few months after my donation, I got a letter from the individual who received my kidney to thank me for my donation. I learned it was a man around my age, and it does me proud knowing that he'll, I'll be, I've been able to change his life like this. It's something that I'll always be able to look back on. It's not a decision to be taken lightly, but for anyone considering altruistic donation, I stress how glad I am that I did it. I'm living my life exactly the same way now that I would have done without donating, but I've been able to change the lives of three other people. 
For more information, visit livingdonation.scot. That article was read by me, Ian. This Week in History February the 1st, 1930 The Times published its first crossword. On this day last year, hundreds of thousands of workers, including school teachers, went on strike for what was the biggest day of industrial action in more than a decade. February the 2nd, 1852 Britain's first gents opened in Fleet Street, followed on February the 11th by the first ladies, just off the Strand. They were dubbed public waiting rooms. On this day last year, the NHS began a world first clinical trial of a pioneering treatment technique aimed at extending the lives of people with brain tumours. February the 3rd, 1983, UK unemployment at a record high of 3.22 million. February the 4th, 1990, the New Zealand cricketer Richard Hadley, later to be united, became the first man to take 400 test wickets. On this day last year, an aristocratic British family made history by travelling to the Caribbean and publicly apologising for its ownership of more than a thousand enslaved Africans. The Trevelyan family, which has many notable ancestors, also paid reparations to the people of Grenada where it owned six sugar, sugar plantations. February the 5th, 1924 The BBC pips or time signals from Greenwich Observatory were heard for the first time. Elkins TV appeal for charity. A Kirkintelic woman coming to terms with the loss of her trusted guide dog has appeared on national television programme. Margaret Hutchison lives with a rare form of glaucoma and is regaining her independence after the sudden loss of canine Bob. Recently, the 71-year-old was chosen to star in a BBC Lifetime appeal for guide dogs to showcase the charity's important work. Guide Dogs Lifeline appeal aired on Sunday, January 28th on BBC One and featured three people who have benefited from guide dogs' life-changing services, including Margaret. During the 10-minute programme presented by actress Wendy Peters, Margaret shared the heartbreaking, the heartbreak of losing her previous guide dog in tragic circumstances while highlighting the incredible support she has received from Guide Dogs Vision Rehabilitation Services, VRS. Everything changed for Margaret in December 2021 when her third guide dog, Bob, collapsed unexpectedly while guiding Margaret. Suddenly, she was left without the support that had enabled her to get out and about safely. Thankfully, Guide Dog's Vision Rehabilitation Team helped her build the confidence to go out and independently again while she waits for her next Guide Dog partnership. Margaret said, It happened very suddenly. My dog collapsed and died when I was out with him. We were, we were working at the time. Overnight, I was terrified of going out the door. You get used to the freedom and independence. Then to lose that, it's just traumatic. Guide Dog's VRS team have helped Margaret navigate safely with her white cane, taught her to find landmarks and showed her how to use an app on her phone that helps read documents, letters or labels. Margaret is grateful for all the support she's received over the last two years and is hopeful she will be partnered with her next dog soon. Every pound raised as part of this BBC Lifeline appeal will be matched by the charity's trusted corporate partner, Pet Plan, up to the value of £20,000. Guide Dog's BBC Lifeline appeal is now available to watch on BBC iPlayer. Further information about Guide Dogs can be found at guidedogs.org.uk. Read by Alan Todd. HPV vaccinations are now available to uni students, as recorded by Hunter MacDonald. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde is holding human papillomavirus vaccination clinics and universities for students who do not receive it in school. The HPV vaccine protects against cervical cancer, genital warts, as well as certain head and neck cancers, anal and genital cancers. The clinics will be held at the University of the West of Scotland, the University of Glasgow, Strathclyde University and Glasgow Caledonian University over the next few weeks. Dr Amelia Crane, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Director of Public Health said 
I would like to ask students who missed or did not receive the vaccine while well, they were at school to attend the clinics to get immunised. The HPV vaccine reduces the risk of developing certain cancers in adulthood and we know that the virus is the main cause of cervical cancer. Having the HPV vaccine and attending routine smear screening appointments dramatically reduces the risk of developing cervical cancer. HPV infection is the cause of most cervical cancers and having both the HPV vaccine and regular routine cervical screening will dramatically reduce the number of people with cervical cancer in Scotland. A person can become infected with HPV through any skin-to-skin -skin contact of the genital area, through vaginal, anal or oral sex, and through sharing sex toys. HPV immunisation is offered to all secondary school children aged 12 and 13 as it is most effective if given before a person is sexually active. More info at nhsggc.scot Turnbull's very good start to 24. Delighted staff and pupils at Turnbull High School in Bishop Briggs have just one New Year's resolution for 2024, and that is to build on the successes they have achieved in their recent inspection report from Education Scotland. Inspectors published a glowing report about the school following visits last year, and this has given everyone at Turnbull High the best possible start to 2024. The inspection rated the school as very good in all four categories reviewed, which include leadership of change, learning, teaching and assessment, ensuring well-being, equality and inclusion, and raising attainment and achievement. Convener of Education Councillor Linda Williamson said, Huge congratulations to the whole school community of Turnbull High on this wonderful inspection report. The inspector's findings and their comments are a testament to the hard work and commitment of the head teacher, her staff, pupils and their families. It is a fabulous school where the young people are supported on their journey to achieve the best that they can. I look forward to visiting Turnbull High School again soon. Some of the key strengths highlighted in the report were the head teacher's strong and caring leadership being highly valued across the school community, teachers having very strong approaches to checking how well learners are progressing and attaining. This allows young people to confidently discuss their strengths and next steps in learning. Young people's attainment and achievements were said to be very strong across the school, and staff used targeted approaches to, to supporting specific young people who require additional support. It was also noted that the school's strong faith-based ethos and Catholic identity ensures young people feel valued and included across the school community. Head teacher Eileen Kennedy added, We are delighted to receive this very positive report which celebrates the significant and many strengths of our school. The detailed narrative recognises the commitment and hard work of the entire school community and highlights the way in which our values underpin this. Households are in need. Over 14,100 households in Eastern Bartonshire face one or more forms of housing need, according to a new report. The stark figure, nearly 30%, follows one of the most comprehensive polls of its kind into the housing needs of the nation, which found over 690,000 households are in one or more forms of housing need. Homes for Scotland, HFS, is the sector body representing the country's home builders and it commissioned the report that found estimates of housing need to of <laughs> estimates of housing need to date have been significantly underestimated with a higher number of households than currently identified to be counted as being in housing need across the local authority area the poll found 10,000 households had at least one concealed household defined as an individual or group in an existing household who wished to move out to form their own but who are unable to do so 3,000 households were overcrowded, 4,000 were unfit, while at least one aspect of the property is in very poor condition. 1,000 households required specialised adaptation or support, and 3,000 households are struggling financially due to high housing costs. HFS Chief Executive Jane Wood said, Adequate housing is a human right, but today 14,100 households in Eastern Bartonshire are in one or more form of housing need. There is simply no excuse for Scotland to continue this housing deficit trajectory. 
by utilising data to inform policies and with public and private sectors working collaboratively and intelligently together, we have the opportunity to recognise the true extent of housing need in Scotland and to build the homes of all tenures that we need in adequate numbers and in the right places. The existing housing needs in Scotland report surveyed 13,690 people across the country finding an alarming number of households are not being counted as part of official figures into housing need. This includes those living in unfit properties, overcrowded accommodation and homes requiring specialist adaptations as well as households that are concealed or struggling financially as a direct result of housing costs. Official data shows that across Eastern Bartonshire, 100 households are living in homeless temporary accommodation with 2,672 people on the waiting list for a social home. Jane Wood added, We need to create an inclusive and agile housing system that meets the needs of all those living in Scotland. We are committed to working with Eastern Bartonshire Council to do just that. As this comprehensive report demonstrates, the level of housing need far exceeds the current calculations used to determine where and how many homes need to be built in Eastern Bartonshire and across Scotland. It provides an effective and robust data tool to help understand true housing needs at local and national levels. It is our hope that, in in our shared endeavour to end the housing crisis, this data will be welcomed and used by the Scottish Government, local authorities and other stakeholders to ensure our housing needs are properly met. NHS staff celebrate after retaining accreditation. NHS Golden Jubilee are celebrating this month after once again maintaining their Investors in Young People Gold Status Accreditation. Investors in Young People, IIYP, focuses on the recruitment, retention and development of young people through providing a framework to organisations looking to enhance and develop their approach and skills. NHS Golden Jubilee was the first NHS Scotland organisation to receive the award back in 2017 and since then has continued to offer support, development, opportunities and employment to the young people of Scotland. Through continued relationships with local schools, colleges and universities, the organisation has provided foundation apprenticeships, mentoring, careers and information events, placements and work experience to young people across the community. Over the past year, NHS Golden Jubilee also introduced their newly qualified nurse induction programme, which provides nurses with the support and information they need to join the organisation. By providing exclusive access to work experience within a healthcare environment, the dedication, the de- dedicated team at NHS Golden Jubilee have now supported over 11 students through their Healthcare Foundation Apprentice Scheme, preparing them to enter college, university and the NHS workforce. Other initiatives include supporting young people through the Young Persons Guarantee Scheme, which provides those aged between 16 to 24 with opportunities to develop their interests and skill set across a wide range of careers within the NHS. The Unique Hospital, which features a four-star Golden Jubilee Conference Hotel, has also opened up their facilities and expertise to the local college, offering placements to those looking for experience working in a busy restaurant kitchen. Director of People and Culture at NHS Golden Jubilee, Laura Smith, said, We are delighted to have retained the Investors in Young People Gold Award. The teams across NHS Golden Jubilee are dedicated to providing opportunities and support to young people in the organisation and their community so they can achieve and thrive in their chosen careers. NHS Golden Jubilee Chief Executive Gordon James said, At NHS Golden Jubilee, We are proud to provide a range of mentoring and learning opportunities to young people. Through initiatives such as the Healthcare Foundation Apprenticeship, the NHS Scotland Academy's Healthcare Pathway Pilot and work experience opportunities, we are providing young people with the tools and support they need to work across the NHS. We look forward to further strengthening our relationships with universities, colleges, schools and the local community to develop our workforce of the future. To find out more about a possible career in healthcare and joining Team Jubilee, visit the NHS Golden Jubilee website. There you'll find more information and a list of current vacancies. CEO set to leave role. 
The Chief Executive of the Bartonshire Chamber of Commerce is leaving to pursue a new challenge. Damon Scott, who has led the development and transformation of the Chamber for the last seven years, will take up a new opportunity with Invest Renfrewshire. During his time there, Damon has boosted the Chamber's turnover, created a string of employment opportunities and was responsible for the creation and delivery of a number of projects and programmes. Over the period he guided businesses through the unprecedented challenges caused by the pandemic, coordinated the delivery of the Scotland Loves local campaign across the Martinshire, and set up the Building Bridges Skills Development Programme and Chamber Force Armed Forces Programme. Of his decision, he said, It has been an absolute pleasure to lead the development of the Chamber. I am extremely proud of our achievements and incredibly appreciative of the relationships I have built and support I have had. We have continued to modernise and position the Chamber as a dynamic organisation at the heart of the Dumbartonshire business community and are now a highly relevant, fast-growing Chamber that promotes accessibility and generates impact for the range of businesses and partners we work with. Damon was a pivotal figure in both East and West Dumbartonshire, representing private enterprise and providing the voice of business to influence local Scottish and UK governments, sitting on a number of strategic boards and committees. Chamber President Mary Ann Smith will take on the leadership of the organisation in the short term to move it into its next phase of development with the support of fellow board members. She said Damon has been the driving force behind the transformation of the Chamber over the last seven years. We are incredibly grateful for dedication and commitment he has shown and the fantastic relationships he has built with members, partners and the wider business community. Whilst he will be sorely missed, we wish him all the best in his new role. I'm sure our loss will be Invest Renfrewshire's gain. Celebration of support. Breathing space for 20 years. Report by Julie Curry. Breathing Space Day on February the 1st marks a significant moment for mental health support in Scotland. For Breathing Space, the free, confidential telephone service also celebrates its 20th anniversary on Thursday. Delivered by NHS 24, it is Scotland's provider of digital and telephone-based health and care services. Once in 2004, the service has grown to become a vital lifeline for countless people across the country, offering a listening ear, practical advice and essential support during times of emotional distress. Over the past two decades, Breathing Space has made a profound impact, responding to more than 1.5 million calls and providing more than 96,000 hours of one-to-one -one support. This crucial service would not be possible without the unwavering commitment of its dedicated staff, who answer calls day and night, offering non-judgmental support to anyone in need. Tony McLaren, National Coordinator, said, For 20 years, Breathing Space has been a beacon of hope for people struggling with their mental health. We are incredibly proud of the difference we've made in supporting individuals and families across Scotland. Our commitment to providing accessible, confidential and compassionate non-judgmental support remains unwavering and we look forward to continuing to be a vital resource for many years to come. Mental Wellbeing Minister Marie Todd has also congratulated the service on reaching the 20-year milestone. She said, I am grateful to, to the Breathing Space staff for the support they have provided to people feeling low, stressed or anxious over the past 20 years support which I know they continue to provide every day. Taking good care of our mental health and, and well-being is as important as looking after our physical health. I would urge anyone who is experiencing low mood, anxiety or distress in their lives to get in touch with Breathing Space or to look at the range of helpful advice in the Breathing Space and Mind to Mind websites. The success of Breathing Space Scotland is also a testament to the strong partnership that it's built with, its, with many organisations. It has worked in partnership with many diverse organisations, from the Scottish Prison Service and the SFA to local housing associations and third sector organisations such as Change Mental Health. Jim Hume, Change Mental Health Director of Public Affairs, said, Support should be available to everyone no matter where they live in Scotland. Change Mental Health's partnership work with Breathing Space is vital to those in our services and wider communities across Scotland. It ensures people get the best support they need and when they need it. 
We look forward to further promoting the work of Breathing Space to help people get the best support and advice available. Take time to breathe. Breathing Space Scotland's 20th anniversary is not just a celebration of past achievements. It is also a call to action to Scots across the country. Mental health challenges continue to impact many people and Breathing Space wants to remind everyone that you matter, we care. If you or someone you know is struggling, remember, it's okay to take some breathing space. A friendly voice and a listening ear are just a phone call away. To access Breathing Space Scotland's free and confidential service, call 0800 838 587 or visit the website at breathingspace.scot to access our online chat and resources. Younger Scots being left with a life sentence. The Stroke Association is reminding people that a stroke can happen to anyone of any age and the effects can be devastating. The charity issued the warning as the latest annual Scottish stroke figures were released. Official figures show that the proportion of strokes that happen in people of working age is growing, an increase of 20% in the last 10 years. John Watson, Stroke Association Associate Director, said, It is concerning to see an increase in the number of younger people having strokes, of which around a third will be left with a lifelong disability. This can leave people stripped of their independence overnight, affecting everything from their ability to go back to work, to partaking in their interests and hobbies. There are about 10,000 strokes in Scotland each year, but to see this number increasing amongst younger people is tragic. Stroke can no longer be the poor relation amongst health conditions. It needs to have greater importance placed on it for there to be a, to be a step change in our approach to improvements. Many stroke survivors describe their stroke as a life sentence, so it is unacceptable to have so many lives affected. Figures also show the inequality gap widening as people from deprived areas are more likely to have a stroke. There are a wide range of socio-economic and historical factors at play, but it is particularly concerning that this health inequality gap is increasing over time. John added, It continues to be a worry that Scotland lags its neighbours. Not only are people in Scotland more likely to have a stroke than those elsewhere in the UK, someone in Scotland who has a stroke is significantly more likely to die from it. Last year, the Scottish Government launched the Progressive Stroke Pathway and an action plan to guide improvements in stroke care. We are right behind this plan, but we need to see effective leadership from the Scottish Government and health boards for positive change. These latest figures speak for themselves. Stroke needs greater attention. It needs effective leadership and innovation to make change happen. Demand is growing. Scotland's charity Air Ambulance took to the air a record number of times in 2023 as demand on the life-saving emergency response service continues to grow. The charity's two helicopter air ambulances based at Perth and Aberdeen took to the air 718 times in response to serious illness and injury throughout Scotland, marking a 3% increase on the previous year. Figures just released show that SCAA also deployed paramedics a further 230 times using the rapid response vehicles. David Craig, SCAA Chief Executive, said the demand on our air ambulances has never been greater and our crews work tirelessly to ensure they will deliver their life-saving service wherever and whenever the need arises. David also thanked the public who ensured SCAA was online 12 hours a day, 365 days of the year, at its Aberdeen and Perth bases. Fascinating new records on Scotland People's Site, report by Julie Curry. A double agent, a historical novelist and a pioneer of radar technology, featuring the 250,000 records newly released online by National Records of Scotland, a number of fascinating birth records are contained on the Scotland's People website, which are well worth exploring further. They include the birth of the Scottish author Dorothy Dunnett, who was internationally recognised for her historical fiction novels. Born in Dunfermline in 1923, Dorothy became internationally recognised for the Lyman Chronicles, six novels set in 16th century Europe, which relate the life and adventures of a Scottish nobleman and mercenary, Francis Crawford of Lymond. 
Hers is one of the 111 902 birth entries newly added to Scotland's people. Also in the new records is the death of Brecon-born scientist Sir Robert Watson Watt, whose discoveries played a key role in defeating Germany in World War II. Born in 1892 in Brecon to a carpenter and his wife, he was awarded bursaries to attend high school and university, where he studied physics and went on to become known as the father of radar. He died, aged 81, in hospital in Inverness, one of 64,545 deaths registered in Scotland in 1973. The marriage of former Russian spy Victor Konstantin Kaladin, who married in Scotland and latterly pursued a varied career as a novelist and clairvoyant, is also documented. Every year, birth records that are 100 years old, death records that are 50 years old and marriage records that are 75 years old are added to the site, allowing family historians and researchers to access them anywhere. Dr Jared Eggdale, National Records of Scotland Chief Executive, said, The start of the new year and the arrival of another major release of scanned records to Scotland's people is one of the eagerly anticipated moments of our year. Being able to access these records from the comfort of your own home or office allows people the freedom to research when it suits them. They're a fascinating source of information and I'm delighted we, we are able to bring them to people in this format. We're highlighting these individuals as a reminder that when it comes to history, no matter your achievements in life, we are all included. Family Announcements Deaths Richardson Ailey Nee Davidson Suddenly at Glasgow Royal Infirmary on January 17th, 2024. Beloved wife of Charlie, a much-loved mum and sister of Wilma. Funeral service to take place on Tuesday, February 6th, 2024 for 2.30pm at Clyde Bank, Dal Notar Crematorium. New Surgery for Babies Cuts Length of Operation Report by Julie Curry A Scotland first approach to cranial synostosis surgery in babies less than four months old has been introduced by the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde craniofacial team at the Royal Hospital for Children. Parents now have the option to choose a shorter minimal access early surgery for their child where previously they only had the option of an average six hour long surgery. That's four, that's a 400% decrease in time that their child needs to be in the theatre. The skull is normally formed by multiple different bones. A suture is the junction between these different bones. Cranial is a condition where a baby is born with one or more of the sutures of their skull fused together. This early Suture closure can cause the skull to grow in an unusual shape and, at times, restrict overall skull growth, which may be harmful to the fast-growing brain within the first few years of life. The Scottish National Centre of Craniofacial Surgery for Children and Young People is the designated centre to manage children born with craniosynostosis and other craniofacial conditions and is based at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, Royal Hospital for Children. Prior to last year, the only surgery option to treat cranial synostosis for babies was an open skull vault remodelling. While this procedure continues to be an effective surgery routinely done around 6 to 18 months, it takes a full day in the operating theatre, requires ear to ear incision, parts of the skull to be removed and reattached surgically, large volume of blood transfusions, a night in the paediatric intensive care unit and a one week stay in hospital. In March 2023, Mr. Hals- Halsnad and Mr. Sangra performed Scotland's first minimal access endoscopic surgery to manage a cranial synostosis baby. Since then, they have carried out six other surgeries like this. All babies require just one or two days in hospital and will partake in 12 to 18 months of helmet therapy to gently mould the shape of their skull. This aspect of therapy is headed by Dr. Mel Dixon, Chief Orthotist at the Royal Hospital for Children. Edward Richards is one of seven babies in Scotland to have received the minimally invasive early access surgery. He had the procedure in April 2023 when he was 12 weeks. 
His mum, Alexandra, said, We had never heard of kinesiosis or how we could help Edward until our options were presented to us. Early detection is so important as that provided me and my husband, Jack, with sur- surgery options. We are fortunate enough to have caught this prior to the four-month mark. It was made clear to us we had options. We could consider the endoscopic approach or the full head reconstruction. There were pros and cons to both, but ultimately it was very clear that we were willing to com- to be compliant and commit to the helmet therapy after the operation, then that was the best option for our family. A few months on and Edward is doing great. He loves going for rides in the back of his mum's bike and playing with his big brother, Angus. Once Edward's helmet comes off, he'll be monitored by doctors and go on to lead his life happily, as normal. As published on Wednesday, the 31st of January, let's talk. The Kirk and Tullock and Bishopbriggs Herald letters page. Please send your letters via email to kirkyherald at jnscotland.co.uk and write letters in the subject field. Please keep letters to a maximum of 300 words. Letters cannot be published without a name and postal address. Also include a daytime phone number if possible. We reserve the right to edit any letter. Yes, do raise the taxis because I'm alright, jock. Sir, we regularly hear complaints about Scottish actors living abroad commenting on the constitution when they don't live here. However, it is the Conservative government which has just introduced legislation meaning any British citizen living abroad can not only comment but can now participate in an election here provided you are registered to vote. And it's for life. The previous 15 year time bar has been quietly abandoned. This means any Scot living abroad can actually vote to alter our constitution irrespective of the fact it will impact us, not them. They can happily vote to increase the taxation we must pay, but which they have sought to avoid by relocating. More than 3.5 million British nationals living overseas will now be eligible to register to vote, despite not paying their taxes here. Furthermore, this will benefit the Conservative Party more than any other. Meanwhile, these same Conservatives want to prevent overseas citizens who actually work and pay their taxes here from voting in UK elections. That's a real scandal. Yours etc. Robert Menzies by email. Russia would roll over at Scottish Navy. Navy. Sir, when NATO generals and others suggest Russia may be in a position to attack the West several years from now, we need to sit up and pay attention. It is unlikely Putin will attempt a traditional invasion, as that would entail a nuclear response and he doesn't want to risk that. We know he has territorial ambitions in Eastern Europe and seeks to re-establish the Eastern Bloc of the post-war world. That is what the former Warsaw Pact countries dread, as they know the level of intimidation and economic hardship that would entail. We do not wish to return to being slave states. Interestingly, an SNP MSP has a not so bad idea of setting up a royal base at Scarpa Flow to protect the North Atlantic, as was the case until the 1950s. Of course, he wasn't thinking of the Royal Navy, but of a Scottish Navy of fishery protection vessels which wouldn't fight in a flea, let alone the Russian Navy. An independent Scotland will be swallowed up by Russia within days, if not hours. However, a serious defence of the UK requires a level of spending by the government of of 4% of GDP, at the very least, as we had during the Cold War. That seems to be a pie in the sky at the moment, and merely shows that the Treasury is still as dense as it always has been, and prefers to penny pinch and not to defend the UK. Yours etc. Andrew H. N. Gray and dress supplied. Hypocrisy. Sir, can we please stop this ludicrous argument over who types what in WhatsApp? The holier than now attitude of many of the commentators in the COVID inquiry reveals a sickening hypocrisy in their desperation to find a smoking gun. Let's try to learn lessons from an entirely unprecedented situation and not to let it happen again. There's no evidence that there was some sort of conspiracy going on. Everyone was doing their best to resolve a desperate problem with literally no experience of such an event. Yours, etc. Brian Bannatyne Scott by email. Showboating. Sir, 
It seems Professor Jason Leach's efforts at the COVID inquiry could be best surmised as I'm not a doctor. I was just there to communicate what others told me. This seems completely at odds with my recollections. Then, he seemed to be showboating, including appearing on football talk shows. It made me think the eminently qualified Professor Hugh Pennington, who was a doctor, in her midst, but was not asked to take a part, presumably because he had regularly deigned to criticise the SNP. Yours, etc. Alexander Mackay, address supplied. It's cuckoo, sir. I was born and lived in Scotland for 37 years, but due to my job ended up in Switzerland and in 1989, I have lived here since. I have followed British and Scottish issues continually. I am and will always be British and Scottish. I have always resented not being able to vote in my home country. If I were a US or Swiss citizen, I would have that right. I have a UK pension. I have paid my share of national insurance and tax. I shall not be deprived of my democratic right to vote in UK elections. Yours, etc. John Reid, Switzerland. Volunteer for Daffodil Appeal. Report by Julie Curry. Marie Curie, the UK's leading end-of-life charity, is calling on Scots to support its Great Daffodil Appeal. The event in March will see volunteers giving up a few hours of their time to distribute the iconic daffodil pins in exchange for a donation. Today, one in four people don't get the end-of-life care they need. Marie Curie's Great Daffodil Appeal encourages people to donate and wear a daffodil pin to help the charity continue to support people with any illness they're likely to die from. The charity's flagship fundraiser, supported by headline partner Superdrug, helps raise much-needed funds for Marie Curie nurses and healthcare professionals to provide expert support in hospice care, either in people's homes or at its two Scottish hospices. Marie Curie is dependent on public donations and last year's supporters helped the charity provide direct care to more than 44,200 people across the UK via its nine hospices and overnight nursing care in people's own homes. The money raised also funds the charity's free support line 0800 090 2309 and web chat which is available to anyone with an illness they're likely to die from and those close to them. It offers practical and emotional support on everything from symptom management and day-to-day care to financial information and bereavement support. Ashley Thompson, Community Fundraising Head in Scotland said Everyone deserves expert in the life and support. The Great Daffodil Appeal, now in its 38th year, is a brilliant and fun way to join in and give back to our local community while also helping us provide a vital service to those in the final chapter of their lives. Volunteering is super simple and our team will be on hand to support you throughout to make sure you have everything you need, including the big yellow hat. By giving up your time, you will be helping Marie Curie continue to provide expert end-of-life care and support for people with any illness they are likely to die from. We'd love to hear from you. To find out more about volunteering, visit www.mariecurie.org.uk slash get hyphen involved slash collecting. College lecturers mandate for strike. College lecturers across Scotland have delivered a decisive vote in favour of industrial action on pay as a long-running national dispute continues. The statutory ballot which closed on Wednesday was organised by the country's largest teaching union, the Educational Institute of Scotland, EIS, and covers EIS Further Education Lecturers Association, EIS-FELA, members and colleges the length and breadth of Scotland. In the ballot, 85% supported action short of strike, while 77% supported strike action. The ballot comfortably passed the restructure of threshold set by the UK government's anti-trade union law, meaning that both strike action and action short of strike may be implemented when the EIS decides to enact its renewed mandate. Andrea Bradley, EIS General Secretary, said... Scotland's college lecturers have delivered a very clear result in this statutory ballot. As published on Wednesday the 31st of January, District News 
Churches. St James Church, Hilton Road, Bishop Briggs, Rector Reverend Canon Paul Watson, 0141 230 4080. There is a communion service on Thursday, February the 1st at 11am and on Sunday, February the 4th at 9am in the chapel and at 10.30am in the church with hymns. Everyone is welcome to come along to any of these services. Do stay on for tea, coffee and fellowship afterwards. On Sunday, February the 4th, from 3pm to 4pm, there is a session of Crafty Kids in the hall. All families are very welcome to come along and enjoy activities together. There are also other virtual services and groups. For up-to-date information, refer to our social media. Facebook, St James the Less Bishop Briggs. Website, www.stjamesbishopbriggs.org.uk Kirk and Tillis Church of God at Regent Hall Regent on Sunday. There will be a family praise service at 4pm. This will feature our praise band, video clips and guest speaker Simon Fisher from Bathgate. Refreshments will be served after the service. Everyone welcome. Every Wednesday, our coffee corner is open from noon to 2pm for home baking and coffee. Join our friends and neighbours for a chat over a coffee. For up to date and further information on our services, visit our website on www.regenthall.org. Jesus said, For my Father's will is, is that everyone who ble- looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John chapter 6 verse 40 Colston Well Park Church Brighten up your week at Colston Well Park Church this Sunday, where a warm welcome awaits you at our morning service starting at 11am, led by Reverend Matthew Cuthbert- Malcolm Cuthbertson and... As normal, you're invited to join us for tea, coffee and conversation in the hall after the service. The Art Club continues this Monday starting at 10am to 1pm. As always, new members are invited, so come along and give it a try if you, and if interested, give Ramsey a call on 07709 584 680 for more information. This Wednesday, the Colston Tea Break or Community Drop-In Continues from 11am to 12.30pm. Feel free to pop in for good food, good champ, chat and of course good company. The food bank continues its essential work within the community and is open every Friday from 11am to 1pm and 2pm to 4pm. And to all who continually donate and assist, we give you our sincere thanks. Came your parish church. From 10am to 10.45am each Sunday we will be offering breakfast in the church hall before the service begins at 11am. This Sunday's morning service will include a presentation by Tear Fund and will be led by our Assistant Minister, Reverend Key Gardner. You are welcome to join us both in church and on our YouTube channel. The service on YouTube can be watched live if it is streamed or later at a time that suits you. You can find our channel by simply searching for Ken Muir Bishop Briggs on YouTube. Ken Muir is spelled K-E-N-M-U-R-E. Teas and coffees and a time of fellowship follows the end of the church service. The most up-to-date details of all of our groups that are currently running may be found on our website, kenmuir-church.co.uk. To find us on Facebook, just search for Ken Muir Parish Church. If you would like to join our WhatsApp group or receive the Bible studies from ABC, then email us at kemyourchurch at sign icloud.com. Lindsay Union Parish Church. Sunday service at 11am will be read by Reverend Dan Carmichael. Young people are also welcome to Lighthouse and Bible Class. A live stream of the service is available on YouTube via our website. The meeting place opens for tea and coffee and home baking every Wednesday, 10am till noon in the new hall. Everyone, from the very young to the young at heart, is welcome to attend. We also have a good selection of greetings cards and second-hand books for sale. Youth Cafe Thursdays, 3.45pm to 5pm. A place where young people can hang out, relax and have a good time after a long day at school. Each week there is a free snack. 
with lots of different things to do, such as games consoles, table tennis, arts and crafts, board games and more. The coffee pot is open on Fridays 10am till noon in the new hall for teas, coffee and chat. Silver Movers Dance Exercise takes place 1.30 to 2.30pm in the old hall on the first and third Monday of each month. Come and dance, relax and enjoy. Contact Claire 07421 257 22. Messy Churches on Saturday, February the 3rd from 4pm to 5pm. A fun-filled hour for the whole family. Springfield Cambridge Church. Morning worship on Sunday, February the 4th will be conducted by Reverend Ian Taylor, assisted by our assistant manager, Mrs Julie Harty, in the sanctuary at 11am. The Sacrament of Holy Communion will be celebrated at this service. There will be a retiring collection in aid of the Kirk Session Benevolent Fund. Tea and coffee will be served in the Cabernet Hall after morning worship. Come along and enjoy the fellowship. No collection is taken during the service, so donations can be made by placing them in the offering plates in the Hall of Fellowship as you enter or leave the building. The Sunday School meets in Room 2, where creche facilities are also available. Morning worship has also been live streamed in the Springfield Cambridge Church YouTube channel. A link to this can be found on the Springfield Cambridge Church website www.springfieldcambridge.org.uk and Facebook page where up-to-date information about events and church organisations can also be found. There will be a vestry hour on Wednesday, January the 31st from 10am to 11am for anyone who would like to speak with the minister. There will be a short weekly service of worship in the Springfield Chapel on Wednesday, January the 31st from 11.10am to 11.30am, followed by tea and coffee in the Hall of Fellowship. The latest edition of the Springfield Cambridge Record is now available online. Home Church Scotland, Lammermoor Road, Kirkintilloch, G66 2AB, Home Church Kirkintilloch, Home Church East End, Carmyle G32 ADP, and online, A Church for All Ages. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. Psalm 24 verse 1 Sunday, February the 4th, 10am Prayer meetings followed by refreshments 11am Worship service followed by refreshments A warm welcome awaits you Home Church Carmyle 10am and 6.30pm Home groups will recommence on February the 6th and 7th Youth group Fridays at 7.30pm Home radio is available every day. See Facebook, Instagram and Home Church website for the latest information for Carmyle and Kirkintilloch. Milton of Campsie Parish Church. We meet for worship on Sunday, February the 4th. All the children's and youth groups meet as normal. Baby and toddler group, hobbies club and badminton meet on a Monday. Cafe Connect is on Tuesday morning. On Wednesday... At 7pm we meet for a time to pray in the Eric Liddell. Come when you can, leave when you must. On Friday the BB Anchor and Junior Sections meet at 6.15pm. Advance notice. Go Mad Extra on Sunday February the 25th from 1pm to 3pm. More information to follow. Cadder Parish Church, beside the canal. For full details, please see our website www.cadderchurch.org. We look forward to welcoming you this coming Sunday to our morning service. The service today will include communion and also a service at the South Hall at 3pm. Our music is led by Javier Jose Yusendo Malo, MNUS. All are welcome. Tea and coffee served at bo- after both services. Food bank. If you wish to donate to the local food bank, you can bring your donations of food to the church or the coffee shop. Early Fellowship meets in person in the South Hall Chapel at 9.30am on Tuesday and Thursday and also on Zoom. Cather Coffee Shop, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday 10am to 2pm and Friday 10 till noon. A warm welcome awaits you. Cather Messy Play, 
Tuesday and Thursday, South Hall, 10.30am to 11.30am. The Guild is on Thursday 1st of February in the South Hall at 7pm. The speaker is John Brown and his subject is the Kuchenhof Gardens. As usual, anyone is welcome. First Monday meets on Monday, February the 5th at 1.30pm in the North Hall. They will be having a beetle drive and games afternoon. All are welcome. BB Quiz Night, Friday, February the 9th. Maximum of six people. Donation at the door. Halftime Buffet. Climate Change Conference, Saturday, March the 9th from 10am to 1pm. Cadder Church, South Halls. 92nd Glasgow Company. The Girls' Brigade, Tuesday's Explorers, P1 to P3, 6.15pm to 7.30pm. Juniors, P4 to P7, 6.30pm to 8pm. Brigadiers, S1 to S6, 7.30 to 9pm. 212th Boys' Brigade, Anchor Boys, P1 to 3, Monday, 6pm to 7pm. Junior Section, P4 to 6, Monday 7.15 to 8.30pm. Company slash senior section, P7 to S6, Friday 7pm to 9pm. St Mary's Parish Church. The service on Sunday February the 4th will begin at 11am and be taken by the Reverend Dr Ruth Morrison. There will be age appropriate activities for the young people in the halls. The craft group meet on Mondays at 2pm in the session house. On January 31st, Wednesday Welcome will meet in the session house where tea, coffee and home baking will be available from 10am to 11.30am. This will be followed by a short service taken by the Reverend Ruth Morrison. On Wednesday, February the 7th, the first of our monthly open doors will take place. The church will be open between 10.30am and 3.30pm. Tea and coffee will be available during this time. Tickets for the lunch on Sunday, February the 18th will be on sale from February the 4th after the service. Cost £1 plus a donation on the day. Torrens Parish Church. The morning service in person is at 10.30am conducted by Reverend Stuart Irwin. During the service, the youngsters meet together in creche, junior church and frog. To join the service, Online, go to www.torrensparishchurch.online.church. The cafe is open every Wednesday at 9am to noon for tea and coffee and delicious home baking. Why not come and taste for yourself? The Girls Brigade meet on Wednesday 6.15 to 8.15pm, P1 to S6, and the Boys Brigade meet on Thursdays from 7pm to 9pm, P7 to S6. To find out about regular weekly activities, check the website for what's on at www.tpc.org.uk. Swan the rabbit needs a new home. Swan is a beautiful bunny who is looking for a relaxed home where she can take her time to grow in confidence. She is currently being cared for by the Scottish SPCA Edinburgh and Lothian's Animal Rescue and Rehoming Centre. She is nervous about being picked up, but once in your arms she relaxes. She enjoys a treat and lots of fresh vegetables. Swan will require a home with ample space so she can hop around and explore. The more room to roam, the better. Rabbits are social animals, so Swan may be able to live with other rabbits following a suitable introduction period. If you can give Swan a new home, visit Scottish SPCA at www.scottishspca.org forward slash rehome dash a dash pet forward slash 13784 dash Swan. District News General, Wednesday the 31st of January. Society of Antiquities. The next meeting of the Kirkintilloch District Antiquities will be on Thursday, February the 1st at 7.30pm in the Park Centre, 45 Kerr Street, Kirkintilloch. Nina Baker will give a talk on rope making and rope makers in Scotland. Nina gave us two excellent online talks on women in engineering during lockdown and this will be her first presentation to one of our live meetings.
We look forward to welcoming her. Hollywood View Helping Others to Have a Better Life by Rona Mackay, MSP We have some wonderful organisations in my constituency of Strathkelvin and Bears Den, all of which help to make life better for others. None more so than Deaf Blind Scotland, whose state-of-the-art HQ is based at Lenzie. It must be challenging enough to be without one of your senses, let alone two, but under the leadership of CEO Isabel Goldie, the inspirational team are doing so much to make life better for, for people with a dual sensory impairment. I'm delighted to be leading a debate at Holyrood on February the 7th on deaf blindness being formally recognised in Scotland as a distinct disability, as it is defined in Nordic countries, after putting forward a motion in the Scottish Parliament. It is a crucial step towards identifying, diagnosing and supporting people with dual sensory loss. I applaud Deaf Blind Scotland, its members, staff and volunteers, for working to ensure that lived experience plays an integral part in informing policy. There is no doubt that 2024 has got off to a busy start in my constituency. I was delighted to meet recently with the new Area Commander for Eastern Buckinghamshire, Police Chief Inspector Aidan Higgins. It's clear he is committed to ensure the local area remains a safe place to live, work and visit. I was also impressed with the work being done by Chief Inspector Higgins and his team in conjunction with Domestic Abuse Support Service Assist to help tackle and prevent gender-based violence through workshops at local secondary schools. The start of the year tends to focus on getting fit, losing weight, trying new challenges, but for many of my constituents, the challenge is simply getting through each day. However, I was heartened to hear that Scotland is feeling better than the rest of the UK in tackling poverty. New research from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation highlighted Scotland's much lower child poverty rate of 24%, compared to 31% in England and Wales, and much of this was attributed to the SNP government's Scottish Child Payment which provides low-income families with £25 a week for each child, rising to £26.70 from April. If you need assistance, contact my team at 0141 776 1561 or email rona.mackay.msp at parliament.scot that's r-o-n-a dot m-a-c-k-e-y dot m-s-p at sign P-A-R-L-I-A-M-E-N-T dot S-C-O-T Out of Town Women in Business A new hub to encourage and support more women to get started and grow successful businesses is opening in North Lanarkshire. The Hive, located at 1 Wellwind in in Airdrie, will offer desks, offices and meeting rooms, treatment rooms, on-site business advice and support, and events and networking opportunities. Use of the workspace is free until August 2024 and will be available 24-7 to suit all users' needs. (coughs) (coughs) North Lanarkshire Council invites everyone interested to the Hive launch on February 2nd where they can tour the facility and enjoy lunch. To book a free space, visit www.eventbrite.co.uk Virtual Tour for Carers Carers in Eastern Bartonshire are invited to join Carers Link for a virtual guided tour of the Palace of Holyrood House that will take place on Wednesday, January 31st at 2.30pm via Zoom. The virtual tour is organised by Carers Link Eastern Bartonshire's Take 5 project During the tour, our host will deliver a 45-minute chat with images and videos, followed by questions and discussions. Carers need to be registered with Carers Link, which you can do at www.carerslink.org.uk. Once registered with Carers Link, put a place online at www.carerslink.org.uk slash events. Inner Wheel Collect 100 for 100 Recently, the Inner Wheel Club of Kirk and Tell celebrated Inner Wheel Day and 100 years of their organisation with afternoon tea. 
All the inner wheel clubs were asked to do 100 for 100 to mark the occasion. Kirkintilla Inner Wheel decided to collect 100 food items from members f- for a local food bank. The Inner Wheel Club of Kirkintilla meet in the Lindsay Golf Club G66 5DA. We meet at 6pm for a 6.30pm start on the second Tuesday of each month from September to June. Meetings January and February are held on Zoom. We welcome new members for further information about Inner Wheel. Please contact iwsecretary.d23 at gmail.com Public Notices Planning Notices Eastern Bartonshire Council Public Notices Planning Applications Format Application Number followed by Address slash Location followed by Proposal followed by Type of Advert Followed by period of reps. TP slash ED slash twenty three slash zero seven three four. Glazert Water, Glen Road, Lennox Town, Eastern Barnshire. River Restoration Works to the Glazert Water, Regulation twenty brackets one, departs. 21 days. TP slash ED slash 23 slash 0749. 27 Victoria Road, Lindsay, Eastern Bartonshire, G66 5AR. Landscaping involving removing of swimming pool, removal of planters, enlarge driveway, Changes to hard surfacing and rebuilding of steps. Reg 5. Listed building consent. 21 days. TP slash ED slash 24 slash 0013. Wester Lee, 35 Victoria Road, Lindsay, Eastern Barnshire. G sixty six five AR Erection of Outbuilding to Rear of Dwelling House Section sixty five Affecting CA twenty one days If you are unable to view the plans on the Council's website, then please contact the Planning Duty Officer to arrange a suitable time to view the plans in our offices. Written comments may be made within the above period to the Council through the Council's website or to the above address. Any representations will be treated as public documents and made available for inspection by interested parties and may also be published on the Council's website. Maya's debut down under. An article written by Brian Yule and read by me, Corey. Lindsay tennis player Maya Lumsden enjoyed her time in Australia, despite being unable to replicate her Wimbledon heroics at the first Grand Slam of the year. Lumsden teamed up with Osana Kalishnikov from Georgia to make her debut at the Australian Open, as regular partner Nikta Baines had not made the trip down under. The duo warmed up for Melbourne at two tournaments in France, as well as the Hobart International, which saw Lumsden celebrate her 26th birthday on Tasmania. Lumsden was also part of the Great Britain team, which saw in the new year by participating in the United Cup in Perth. At the Australian Open, it would be a first-round exit for Lumsden and Kalishnikov as they lost to wildcard entries Ajla Tom Lajonovic. I think that would be. It's A-J-L-A, and then the second name is T-O-M-L-G-A-N-O-V-I-C, and Daria Savile. However, despite the result, Lumsden was delighted to make her Grand Slam bow on foreign soil. She said, to be around a Grand Slam that's different from Wimbledon was a really amazing experience. 
Every tennis player wants to start their year in Melbourne, so to make my Australian Open debut was a goal achieved for me. Every day the crowds were packed and there was a great atmosphere around the place. Everyone just seemed to love tennis. It was my first time in Australia since the junior events and it was a great experience. It was good to go to the United Cup and while losing a tight match in Hobart was frustrating, it's nice when tournaments put on events like going to see the animals. That was a different way to spend my birthday. Lumsden was joined in Australia by her sister Eve and some of her friends, who just happened to be in the country at the time. She said, my friends don't know much about tennis, but because I didn't have a coach with me, they got into the playing areas and behind the scenes, which they found pretty cool. That article was written by Brian Yule and read by me, Corey. Fours Bloom has arrived to boost the city midfield. An article written by Brian Yule and read by me, Corey. Glasgow City has signed midfielder Wilma Forsbloom from Finnish Trouble Winners Cups on a two and a half year deal. The 20 year old featured 23 times last year, scoring 10 goals in an extremely successful campaign. Forsbloom, who has been capped by Finland at under 17s, under 19s, and under 23s level, has four seasons of top flight experience in her homeland under her belt. She started her senior career at PK35 Vanta in 2020 and has already amassed 85 appearances in club football and has scored 40 goals. City head coach Leanne Ross said, Wilma arrives at Glasgow City having gained great experience from her time at the Can Salinen Liga and having represented Finland at all international youth levels. At both club and international level, she has proved her capability to perform consistently to a high standard and impact games with her ability to create and score goals from midfield. Wilma's athleticism, game intelligence and technical ability fit perfectly with the style of football we want to play here at Glasgow City and for that reason we are excited to welcome her to the club. As well as adding creativity and goal scoring threat to our midfield, Wilma's versatility and experience will be of huge benefit to us at this stage of the season. I very much look forward to working with Wilma and can't wait to see the positive impact she can have during her time at the club. Forsblum added, I'm very excited to join the club. Everyone has been so welcoming on my arrival. The team have a history of winning and I look forward to hopefully helping to contribute to this. City moved to within two points of second placed Celtic in the SWPL1 on Sunday with a 1-0 win at home to the Parkhead side. Recent signing Fiona Brown grabbed her first goal since returning to the club as she scored what turned out to be the winner after just 15 seconds with a cross that looped over Kelsey Doherty to nestle in the net. Kenzie Weir came close to doubling City's lead in the first half but her header from a corner was headed off the line by Celtic defender Chloe Craig. It is a break for the league on Sunday as City host Hibernian in a fourth round of the Scottish Cup. That article was written by Ryan Yule and read by me, Corey. Rob Roy move six points clear of the regulation zone. This article is unattributed, but it's being read by me, Corey. Kirkintilloch Rob Roy moved six points clear of the regulation zone in the WOS Premier Division with a 2-1 win away to Arthurley on Saturday. Jordan Scott gave the visitors the lead from the penalty spot in the first half, but Mick McNeil's equaliser would ensure the sides went in level at the break. 
A Jake Sterling goal put Rob Roy back in front and despite having Chris O'Kane set off after he was shown a yellow card, they held on for three points. Rob Roy host Pollock in the fifth round of the South Region Challenge Cup on Saturday. Peters Hill have now gone three games without a win in the First Division as they drew 2-2 at home to Thornywood United. Alex Cassells gave the home side the lead from a low Dell Hepburn corner after nine minutes. That is the way it would remain until United equalised through Daniel Kindlan with 15 minutes left and then Cammy Smith put them in front three minutes later. However, with four minutes remaining, on loan St. Caddox winger Pierce McGarvey cut in from the left to fire home and rescue a point. Ashfield's trip to Blantyre, Victoria was called off following a pitch inspection. Peters Hill host Blantyre on Saturday, while Ashfield are in Challenge Cup action away to the winners of St Andrews United versus Kenaway Star Hearts, who were playing last night, brackets Tuesday. Caledonian Locomotives moved up to second in the second division with a 2-0 win away to Muirkirk Juniors, with Anton Finn and an own goal giving them the points. Glasgow Persher grabbed in a point in their fight to beat the drop as they drew 2-2 at St Anthony's. Babukar Musa opened the scoring from the spot before Shire went 2-1 down. They then missed the second penalty, but Kevin Phil struck the equaliser. Cali head to Bonnyton Thistle on Saturday, while Shire are at Yoker Athletic. West Park United lost 3 2 at home to Bells Hill Athletic in the 3rd Division. Rossville are up to 3rd in the 4th Division with a 3 2 win away to Saltcoats Victoria as they came back from 2 0 down with goals from Daniel Fitzpatrick, Mark O'Rourke, and Conan Rendell. They could move to within two points of the top as leaders Glenville come calling on Saturday. That article was unattributed, but it was read by me, Corey. Let battle commence for Guinness Six Nations. This article is unattributed, but it's being read by me, Corey. Rugby Union fans will be gripped with sporting fever on February 2nd when the Guinness Six Nations Championship kicks off with reigning Grand Slam champions Ireland taking on last year's runner-up, France in Marseille. On opening day, other matches will include Italy hosting England at the Studio Olimpico in Rome and Wales taking on Scotland at the Principality Stadium in Cardiff to complete the first round of fixtures. The competition consists of five rounds, with every country playing all others in a round-robin style competition. Exeter Chiefs lock Daffod Jenkins, 21, will become the second youngest man to lead out Wales after being named as captain of the Wales Six Nations squad, the youngest being Sir Gareth Edwards at the age of 20. Other notable players at this year's championship include Nolan Lee Garrick of France. He replaces Anton Dupont, and is seen as the closest thing to a like-for-like replacement. Hooker Jamie George, 33, has been confirmed as England's captain for the Six Nations, following Owen Farrell's decision to step away from international rugby, while Wales-born winger Emmanuel Fee Waboso, that's F-E-Y-I, hyphen, W-A-B-O-S-O, has earned a maiden call-up for England. Other notable inclusions are Calvin Nash, Ireland, who steps in for the injured Mac Hansen, filling his spot on the wing. In the new era of Italian rugby under head coach Gonzalo Quesida, 
The uncapped South African-born Exeter Chiefs back rower, Ross Vincent, has been drafted in. After suffering a serious thigh injury in autumn, Bath back rover Josh Bayliss has been brought back from the rugby wilderness for Scotland. Fixtures this season will continue to be shown on both BBC and ITV in the UK. Live streams will be available for free on the BBC iPlayer and ITVX apps, and will be available to download on mobile or tablet devices. France and Ireland are favourites to win the competition, with England a little way behind, followed by Scotland, Wales and then Italy. England have won the most total titles, with their record dating back to the Home Nations Championship, which did not include France and Italy. They have won 29 titles, with 10 of those being shared. 2024 Six Nations Fixtures Round 1 All Times GMT Round 1 Friday, February 2nd France vs Ireland Kickoff 8 p.m. Venue Orange Velodrome, Marseille. Referee Carl Dixon, English. Saturday, February 3rd, Italy v England. Kickoff 2:15 p.m. Venue Stadio Olimpico, Rome. Referee Paul Williams, New Zealand. Saturday, February 3rd. Wales vs Scotland. Kickoff 4:45 p.m. Venue Principality Stadium, Cardiff. Referee Ben O'Keefe, New Zealand. That article was unattributed, but it was being read by me, Corey. That concludes this week's edition of the Kiffinville Herald Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service.